This is the fifth in the series of videos that retraces the life of Mary Rabagliati. Previously, she left her native England at age 20 to live in an emergency camp for homeless families in France, where Joseph Rudzinski was recruiting a full-time volunteer corps to develop ATD Fourth World. After three years in France, Mary spent a year in the United States to learn from the war and poverty there. Shortly after returning with Mary to France, Rosinski decided that ATD Fourth World had to expand because he thought the chaos of the emergency housing camp was holding them back and limiting their vision. In order to work on behalf of people in poverty in many countries, ATD opened an international centre northwest of Paris. Once this was underway, Rosinski asked Mary to move to the United Kingdom to live and work at Framehurst, a residential centre for families in poverty. Frimhurst is a place where parents who often did not grow up with their own families can learn from one another how to bring up their children. Our approach is to have faith in these families to start with, so that later they will begin to have faith in themselves. For most of them, Frimhurst represented the last chance to keep custody of their children. This was an enormous pressure on everyone. There was nowhere to hide, and my entire identity was challenged. Frimhurst is where I felt the most frustrated and angry. We were all under one roof night and day with all of our day-to-day -day bitchiness. You had nowhere else to go at the end of the day. Once, I was in a terrible mood. On my way out the door for my day off, I shouted at one mother, I hope the house burned down with you in it. Of course, the minute the words were out of my mouth, I wanted to sink into the ground with shame. I spent the whole day kicking myself for my temper. It was terribly hard to talk to her again that evening. But in the end, it does people good to see your true self. And my true self has a temper. Especially when I slept badly and then I see the children deliberately bashing a bird's nest or trampling the flower garden. And when I know I've behaved badly, perhaps it keeps me from becoming pretentious. At Frimhurst, we live together as human beings and we all make mistakes and we spoil things. We volunteers are able to forge a real relationship with the families because we are human and we do make fools of ourselves at times. In their troubles, unhappy families will blame you for everything that's gone wrong in their lives. They say exactly what they think of you. You're an idiot. You've got your nose in the air. You insult people all the time. You don't know how to listen. These are hard things to hear, especially when you've come in order to help people. But it was important that the families at Frimhurst feel free enough to say anything. They could use you as a punching bag to try to free themselves from whatever life had done to them. Living at Frimhurst also taught me to listen more intently, without interrupting to question or offer explanations. You shouldn't say, I'm listening, unless you're truly open to understanding what a person has to say and putting yourself in their shoes. For anyone who is naturally active and wants to be helpful, that does not come naturally. We had to admit that none of us had immediate advice to offer. Instead, we really took time to think together about how to respond to what each person wanted. More than anything, these families needed people who could lead them to explore and understand their environment and enlarge their experience beyond their narrow horizons. We volunteers couldn't hope to help if we became stale intellectually. If we let ourselves wallow in miserable feelings about poverty, we become stunted with nothing left to offer anyone. We had to convince families in poverty that they deserve to be part of the world. They deserve paintings and music. They deserve the stars and everything on earth. We invited them to use Frimhurst and to use us volunteers for whatever they dreamt of accomplishing. The families could invent their own projects and change their destiny. In 1973, Mary began organising monthly People's University discussions in Frimhurst. Themes ranged from cultural differences to international human rights questions to local political issues. The goal of the discussions was for all participants to be able to speak freely, understand more about society and reflect on their individual identity and history. 
Right from the beginning, there was only one topic that we decided to keep off limits. Social workers play such a massive role in families' lives that we wanted to make room to speak about everything else. We actually banned the words social workers for the first two years of these discussions. There is so much else to talk about. We wanted people in poverty to see themselves in the other dimensions of life, from culture to politics. The themes of these meetings included economic trends and public policy, and elected officials were questioned about their priorities for the public budget. Later, when the UK was changing laws about birth control and abortion, Mary organised family meetings about those issues and also conducted private interviews of many people in poverty who wanted to talk the issues over, but not in public. During another year, the focus was on learning more about the countries of origin or culture of different British minority communities. Bengali, Black British, Hindu, Irish, Jewish, Muslim, Sikh, West African or West Indian, for example. The discussions focused on strengthening intercultural solidarity and keeping one's dignity in the face of different forms of discrimination, alienation or racial profiling. One way of breaking down our isolation is to discover that we are all in the same boat. When we find people who listen to us and understand us, we can help each other. Instead of moving away from a community that is poor and has a bad reputation, we can decide to change it together with our neighbours. Each of us has the responsibility to look to ourselves and see how we can give help, courage and hope to people we know who are in need. Together, we have learned that by starting to stand up for ourselves, we can get together with others to fight for those who have the greatest difficulties. Another concern of Mary's was how HED could dialogue with society as a whole. By the 1970s, more English young people were choosing to get involved in some kind of struggle with labour unions or on behalf of the elderly or of women. However, we at Frimhurst remained somewhat isolated. I think because we made a point of choosing to work with families in the greatest difficulties. Time and time again, I was told that we were dreamers and lunatics. Mary was determined to change people's minds and convince them to come and see for themselves while helping Frimhurst by participating in voluntary work camps for the upkeep of the building and grounds. In any given year, Mary and the other volunteers at Frimhurst welcomed more than 100 participants for these work camps. Since her arrival at Frimhurst, Mary had collected the names and addresses of everyone interested in the project. She wrote many personal letters and newsletters to inform people about it and to request donations. Eventually, it became clear that this kind of strategic communications work needed a different setting in order to flourish. In 1977, nine years after Mary settled at Frimhurst, other ATD volunteers took over responsibility for the residential centre so that Mary could leave to open a national centre in London to be used as a base for ATD members to participate in conferences and influence policymakers. Mary set off with two other volunteers to look for a new place. For their first year in London, the three of them had no fixed address to live or work and often ended up using libraries to do research during the day and sleeping on friends' floors at night. Finally, we found a property in Southwark that could become our national centre. We didn't have any money, but we were lent money from all sorts of places. Later we scraped together donations to pay it back bit by bit. Now that we have this house, it is a place where all the hopes and aspirations of the poorest people are engaged. In Frimhurst, the daily lives of just seven or eight families at a time consumed all our energy, day and night. It was almost impossible to see anything beyond those few families and their individual crises. Our minds were hemmed in from all sides. We needed another physical place in order to convince society that a new approach is needed to overcome poverty. Despite our efforts in London, we remain very little known. On top of that, when budget cuts hurt people in poverty, there can be a sense of discouragement. However, we are a movement that won't sink into pessimism. 
Instead, as a movement that defends the poorest families, we try to find new possibilities. We go to Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park to meet new people. Even though we have to speak to hundreds of people before connecting with one of them who decides to turn up at our next meeting. We write letters to about 4,500 people each year. And every single one of these people is of some hope for everything we are trying to accomplish. The families who come to Frimhurst have been totally left alone. What's a shame about social welfare services is that no extent of services, however necessary, will provide people with an opportunity to contribute something and to gain a sense of achievement. This is what we did at Frimhurst. Each person realised that they were in fact completely capable of doing something that was useful to other people. That gives them freedom and leads them to become the ones who will reach out to offer encouragement whenever they see someone else suffering. This is the fifth video in the series of excerpts from the book Quiet Revolution, the story of Mary Rabagliati and People the World Forgot. <laughs>